As Steve mentioned, I've been working uh, with his group, Ari, now for over two years. And primarily the work that I've been doing is with evaluating the potential for resistance to pre-emergence herbicides in annual ryegrass. And that's what I'll be talking to you about today. In particular, uh, primarily our work has been done with a new product, Sakura. And I'll take you through the various work that we've done. I'd also like to mention that a lot of this work has been done by my associate, Roberta Busi, who's another postdoc within our group at UWA. We'll start with a little bit of background about the situation with resistance to trifluralin in Western Australia. What you're looking at here is a map from Michelle Owen's survey with WARI in 2003. You can see various sample sites around the wheat belt. What we're looking at would be green dots are sites where the ryegrass sample was susceptible to trifluralin. So you can see throughout most of the wheat belt, trifluralin is working quite well for pre-emergence ryegrass control. However, you'll notice a number of orange dots fairly evenly spread throughout the sample regions. And these indicate samples that are developing resistance. So when you look at that sample, less than 20% of the individuals within the sample are surviving at the normal labeled rate. So that tells you it should be on the radar. It's beginning to, to be a problem. And one site you'll notice here that was classified as resistant. So that means greater than 20% of the individuals survived the label rate of trifluralin. So this is definitely an increasing problem. Uh, considering that trifluralin is the, the standard treatment for ryegrass control within wheat in a lot of situations, if you look again at Michel's survey from 2003, you can see that about a quarter of the populations were developing resistance. Compare that to similar surveys conducted in South Australia, you can see that 27% of populations were classified as resistant. So it's quite a bigger problem there. And I think this would indicate within Western Australia, this is a developing issue that should be certainly on the radar for producers. However, there is definitely good news and exciting times on the horizon with two new products available as alternatives for trifluralin for ryegrass control pre-emergence. And those are Sakura and Box of Gold. So our research question that we're posing is how to best use these three herbicide options to manage resistance issues in annual ryegrass. Given we have this great situation where we've got two new products that have been introduced and both of which have no known resistance currently in ryegrass populations. So, so specifically, as I mentioned, we have an ARC linkage grant funded to look at Sakura, of which the active ingredient is pyroxysulfone. And we're investigating the potential specifically for this active ingredient for whether or not ryegrass populations can evolve resistance. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. As I said, the active ingredient is pyroxysulfone. Of course, it uh, will be used as a pre-emergence herbicide selective in wheat. It will be classified as a group K herbicide. So this means it's an inhibitor of cell division, essentially. The seedlings will germinate, be exposed to the herbicide, and then their growth will be inhibited as the herbicide prevents the synthesis of very long chain fatty acids. Now, of course, this has activity on ryegrass and, and we should expect to see this product on the market in the near future. So what have we done at RE for our research into Sakura? Here we have a really unique situation. As you know, we've done a lot of resistance work retrospectively with various herbicides to understand how did resistance evolve, how frequent was resistance in the population initially. But here we have a situation, a new herbicide, essentially a new mode of action for ryegrass control. And we're looking at it prior to commercialization, prior to potentially millions of hectares of wheat cropping having this herbicide used. So we can have a chance to actually look at ryegrass populations prior to this selection pressure to look for the potential of resistance. We decided to look at two different scenarios for resistance evolution. The first one is resistance evolution at high rates. In this case, we're looking for a very rare individual within the population that has the traits necessary to survive a very high rate of pyroxysulfone. 
In the second experiment, we're looking at the potential for resistance evolution at low rates. Now, a lot of you would probably be familiar with the work done at ARI in the past, looking at the impact of low rates on resistance evolution. And you would have seen that in many cases, the repeated use of low rates will select for herbicide resistance. So we wanted to look at this scenario with Sakura. And in the end, our objective is to help everyone maximize the sustainability of Sakura and prolong the life of this new herbicide as, as much as possible. And this is something that's never been done before, so this will be a, a world first to look at a new herbicide in this way. For the first experiment, where we're looking at high rate scenario, we had a large field site, nearly three hectares, and we seeded a lot of ryegrass. As you can see, 65 million ryegrass seeds. This is a photo of what 30,000 ryegrass seeds per square meter looks like. Hopefully, no one would see anything like this in their cropping paddocks. What we did then, after incorporating 65 million ryegrass seeds into the soil, was to treat it with a high rate, 400 grams of pyroxysulfone per hectare. And just for reference, this is probably about four times what the label rate will be. And as we expected, we had very massive mortality, very few survivors at 400 grams, of well over 99% mortality. In fact, only 22 individuals out of 65 million survived. And we transplanted those to the glass house at UWA grew those on to produce seed for the next generation. And that's really the true test of whether or not there's resistance, is to take these survivors and look at their progeny. So we did that. We conducted dose response studies on the progeny of all of these surviving individuals. And what we found was that there was no evidence of resistance in any of those very few surviving individuals. So therefore, they survived, but they were not resistant. And what that tells us is that out of the 65 million seedlings that we screened, there was no major effect resistance present within that sample. And further from that, we would conclude that strongly resistant individuals are therefore very rare in ryegrass populations. Now we'll take a look at the second set of experiments, and this is looking at evolution of resistance under low rates. For these experiments, these were conducted in pots grown outdoors in the normal winter growing conditions. And we sprayed uh, the ryegrass seeds with suboptimal or low rates of pyroxysulfone. We took survivors from low rates, let them cross together, took the seed from those and repeated the process the next year and conducted this over several generations to see if we could produce any shift towards resistance out of these populations. We had two populations that we were looking at. The first one that you can see here in this dose response graph in the black dots is our standard susceptible population. So you can see the pyroxysulfone rate on the x-axis and this is plant survival. So you can see the susceptible population is quite well controlled with pyroxysulfone. And we also had a multi-resistant population. This particular population was collected around 20 years ago and has resistance, high level resistance to quite a number of herbicides. What we did for this experiment for both populations was to select survivors at a low rate of pyroxysulfone. And we'll take a look at the susceptible population results first. What we have here for our susceptible population is the first cycle. And just kind of keep this number in mind, 27 grams per hectare. This is the LD50 for the susceptible population. Now what's the LD50? This is the number that we calculate from the dose response data that I just showed you. And it tells you that in order to kill 50% of the population, it takes 27 grams. So you can just think of this as kind of the the tipping point for that population in order to get 50% mortality. Obviously then for commercial control you're at a much higher rate. But we use this number to tell us whether we're seeing any changes 
in the resistance status for a given population in the selection experiment. So again, the susceptible population well controlled with an LD50 of 27. After the first cycle of selection, you can see there, well, there was no shift. We're still seeing the same LD50 after one round. But again, we took all the survivors at a suboptimal rate at 60 grams, which will be less than the label rate. Took those survivors again a second time, and then we did see a shift. The LD50 nearly doubled to 45. And this is where we stopped this particular experiment. But you can see that here after two generations, there has been a, a shift towards resistance. This is what the survivors from that second round look like. This is the, the first photo on the left is the susceptible population at 90 grams of pyroxysulfone. This is, does say Sakura, but um, given it's a 85% granule, we're looking at, at 90 grams of pyroxysulfone. And on the right, you can see the survivors from that second round. So, you know, there are a, a few individuals definitely poking through and growing, so therefore, a low level resistance evolved under a low rate scenario in a susceptible population. All right, so let's step back and, and think about susceptible ryegrass. What can we now conclude for Sakura? In a very large sample, 65 million individuals, we did not find any major effect resistance. And just for comparison, think about the group B herbicides where typically the same type of resistance would be about 1 in 100,000. So that tells you it's quite a bit more rare. At, under a low rate scenario, a low level of resistance evolved, but the principles to be learned from this are that the first selection and the subsequent selections occurred at a low rate, at a cut rate. So therefore, it's very important to use the full rate and get excellent control. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at the multi-resistant population results. As I showed you before, you can see there's a, a little bit of a difference, right, compared to the susceptible population. It takes more pyroxysulfone to control the multi-resistant population. So again, we conducted our selections at the cut rate of 60 grams pyroxysulfone. Now here, we'll take a look at the LD50s from the selection experiment. If you remember, the susceptible population is 27 grams for its LD50, and right away you can see the multi-resistant population is a little higher, so it does take more pyroxysulfone to, to achieve good control out of the multi-resistant population. So starting off, we started at 47, we selected at 60 grams, a cut rate. Now the, the progeny of that first selection, you can see right away the LD50 has increased, it's doubled to over 100 grams per hectare. This time, we increased the selection intensity and selected plants at 120 grams of pyroxysulfone. You can see the LD50 increased a little bit more to 127. Then with one further round of selection at 120 grams per hectare, you can see by the third cycle of selection, the LD50 is over 200 and four times the initial LD50 of the population. So in fact, a fairly high level of resistance evolved from a repeated selection experiment in this pot study. Here you can take a look at the, each of the generations when we conducted the final dose response. And on the right, you'll notice what's labeled as P3. So this is the, the progeny from that third round of selection at 120 grams of pyroxysulfone. And of course, notice that the initial population is completely controlled. So we can conclude that resistance did evolve out of a repeated selection on a multi-resistant population. So what can we conclude from this set of experiments? We know, of course, that multiple resistance in ryegrass does exist in the WA wheat belt. There would be quite a number of populations with multiple resistance. And what we can see by comparing these two populations is just as you would expect, there is genetic diversity in ryegrass for how sensitive populations will be to this new product, pyroxysulfone. Generally, um, 
even the population that we are using, it is controlled at the full label rate. However, as you can, as we said, the first round of selections occurred at a cut rate. And then of course it was repeated use of the same product. So the lesson again is to make sure that Sakura is used at the full label rate when dealing with multi-resistant ryegrass populations. Now we'll go ahead and move on and, and summarize it and give you the take home message from all of this work. What we would definitely say is that Sakura is a good herbicide for ryegrass control. But just like any herbicide, if you were to do this set of experiments, you'd find resistance is possible. Therefore, diversity in management practices is definitely the key to prolong the life and get the most use out of the new product. Therefore, always use the full label rate. Now this would have been our suggestion prior to doing these experiments, of course, but here we have the data for a brand new product to show that cutting the rate is indeed a, a very ill-advised practice in this case. So use the full label rate and certainly rotate between these various options now, including Sakura, Boxer Gold, and Trifluralin. And really that's just an excellent situation from a resistance management standpoint. Of course, the various practices for seed bank management will also be critical. Anything including windrow burning, chaff carts, other methods to reduce the amount of seeds off of survivors being returned to the seed bank will really go a long way towards prolonging the life of all three of these herbicides. And of course, cropping diversity is just part of that overall good herbicide stewardship. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and acknowledge again Kumiai and the ARC for funding the research and I'd be happy to take any questions. I was just wondering about what groups were they resistant? Um, what groups were they resistant? Yeah, so our multiple resistant population that we used is resistant to group A's, group B's, group C's, Group D's and anything else we're forgetting there? Yeah, it's uh, it's quite an interesting population. You know, it's been maintained under in in the herbicide resistance research program for uh, 20 years now. So certainly selecting for resistance, but if you're looking at specific products, it's resistant to diclofop and chlorsulfuron and uh, atrazine, trifluralin. Yeah, various number of things, yeah. I guess, but a, maybe another point to make about that population is it does have enhanced metabolic capability. So when we talk about the cytochrome P450 based mechanism of resistance, it would be a good example of a population that has enhanced capability for that, the ability to detoxify herbicides. And that's probably It'll be interesting to see what we've actually selected, the, the mechanistic basis, but you would guess it probably would have something to do with P450s or the ability to metabolize herbicides. What about in, you're using the full rate, you're putting the full rate into the tank, but perhaps places within the paddock you're getting a cut rate effectively, maybe on margins if you're getting a spray gap, or as a, a residual product is breaking down over time and and seedlings are germinating through that, perhaps then being exposed to a, a low rate. And I would say that, yeah, definitely speaks to the importance of anything you can do to, to manage seed set. And because potentially those are the ones that are then, you know, more likely to produce seed and, and contribute to the next generation. But also, you know, the should be coming up later, so if you have a good competitive crop established, you know, hopefully then uh, the crop competition will go a long ways, but on the fence row, yeah, then you're in a difficult situation. We know, of course, uh, fence rows can be a hot spot when you're thinking about glyphosate use along fence lines. That's where a lot of our glyphosate resistant populations seem to originate, is that fence line uh, repeated use. So I guess as much as anything, it speaks to, you know, those are places to keep, you, keep your eyes on. Um, probably with uh, residual from these products through, you know, 
it'd be interesting to see, you know, what is the point in the season where you might be hitting that, that low rate scenario. And I'm sure as we're working with, with these new products some more, we'll start to understand, you know, how long is, is the half-life in the soil and those type of things. But I suppose I would, yeah, it definitely argues to the, the seed bank management at harvest. Who determines what the full label rate is and whether any of your sort of research is being fed back into managing potential resistance issues with companies? Yeah, well, in terms of who determines the full label rate, well, that's the, the company developing it and, and doing the testing. So, um, yeah, certainly, you know, all through this process, it's, it's been a great cooperation with uh, Bayer Crop Science and Kumiai and and Steve's group at, at Ari um, in terms of sharing results and, and everything that's happening. But, you know, I've never been involved with it, but I'm sure it comes down to, you know, market decisions and, and uh, various things. But, yeah, when you look at what is the full rate, you definitely want to make sure it's at a point where you're getting good control and not, not close to a point where you're letting some survivors through. So. Um, yeah, Todd, excellent work as well. Have you done any comparisons or Ari um, between the cross resistance within the group Ks? Because obviously there's a couple of group K products we're looking at now. Yeah, so um, in terms of cross resistance within the group Ks, I think we've we've done a little bit of work with that. Um, you know, for example, this population I believe is resistant to metolachlor, right? And which is a, a chloroacetamide, a, a group K. Um, so yeah, that's probably, I think, particularly as part of this work, what we'll continue doing is, is look at the cross-resistance patterns between our various uh, group uh, pre-emergence herbicides. But um, generally, uh, we know that a lot of them are able to be metabolized. So that's where you can really, you really want to work on this issue of cross-resistance.